Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, thank you all again for coming to my presentation on starting seeds and summer gardening for beginners. Um, I'm going to try to move through this content relatively quickly, um, just because I have kind of a lot. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and I will try to address them at the end. Um, and so just a little bit about me and UGA Extension before we get started. So I am the agent, the agri agent here in Fulton County. Um, I do have a counterpart, Melissa Matee, and she works out of the East Point office. I'm stationed in Sandy Springs. Uh, and we're here to answer anyone's agriculture related questions in Fulton County. Uh, and UGA Extension, if you're not familiar with it, is basically the outreach portion of the university's research. So we are here to help bring uh, any kind of new knowledge and research to the public. And actually, before I go any further, can everyone hear me okay? Or is there any issues with the sound? Everything's fine? If so, just put yes in the box. Okay, cool. All right, perfect. So let's keep going. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, so why garden? Um, as I'm sure all of you are aware right now, vegetable gardening is extremely popular. We have had so many different calls about um, growing vegetables and just general gardening, flowers, all kinds of stuff as everyone's cooped up at home and looking for something to do. Um, gardening is really good for reducing stress, which I'm sure all of us have at this moment. You know, I mean, it's just a difficult time. Um, it's good for beautifying your landscape, especially if you're into flower gardening. Um, if you have kids at home, it can be a fun learning activity. Uh, many of these things I did as a kid, even just starting seeds, and it's exciting to watch them grow and sprout. Um, and that can be a good science project for them as well. And of course, the most important thing is to produce food. So if you like to cook, if you like to produce food and just, you know, have fresh ingredients, this is a great reason to garden. So I want all of you to take a moment and just think about your garden. So all of you are here because you like to grow things and you like to do different stuff like that. And probably all of you have a place of your own in mind, whether it's on a balcony in a large pot, or if it's in your backyard, if you have some raised beds, it could be a variety of different things, but everybody has something in mind more than likely. So take a moment and just think about your own space. And we're gonna go over these in more detail. Um, but really how much room do you have? So the space that you have is really important and it's gonna be very important in deciding what you can grow and how much of it you can grow and how well it's gonna do. Um, if that site doesn't receive full sunlight, you're not gonna have as good of success as you would if it was directly positioned in the sun. Um, what are considerations? Is, the, is this area far from your house? Is it far from a water hose? Is it in a low spot in your yard that's going to gather water during a rainstorm? Or is it kind of in an exposed area that maybe gets drier faster? Um, all that's going to impact how successful you are with your garden. And finally, how big are your plants going to get? And, and a lot of times people are kind of, you know, at the beginning of the year, we all are so excited. And we, and we kind of kind of go overboard and buy too many plants, too many of one thing, and we, we get overzealous and things get out of control. So here's, here's some pictures for those of you that are skeptical of some sunflowers um, from my in-laws house. They grow them every year in the garden and they always get enormous. These are both over seven foot tall. Um, and that's a single plant right there. If, I think you guys can see my mouse, but that is a single plant and they get absolutely just enormous whenever they have all the nutrients and sunlight and space that they need. And some of our garden crops are that way as well, especially okra and corn. Um, they can get 
really large. So keep your space in mind. Think about your space a lot and think about what it has that makes it a good spot um, and what it has that might be a drawback. So what is it that you want to grow? So I'm gonna talk about growing things from seed in this presentation. I'm also gonna briefly mention transplanting plants. Um, everything that I've highlighted in yellow is going to be something that's easy to grow from seed. Uh, so for on the from seed column, I've got, you know, kind of grouped into different categories. Annual summer flowers, some of our big flowers like zinnias, sunflowers, um, and nasturtiums as well are good to start from seed in your garden. Uh, many of our summer crops do best when grown from seed, corn, beans, cucumbers, any of those are going to do fine planted directly in, this, in the soil. Uh, greens are another good one, including salad mixes or lettuces. And finally, root veggies. So I have radishes, beets, carrots, and turnips here. Those are all relatively easy to grow. I, I didn't highlight carrots because for whatever reason, I never seem to be able to do well with them. They grow much slower than the other three. And um, you're, of course, more than welcome to try any of these things that I have listed on here, you know. So it's, it's I'm really just trying to highlight some very simple ones that are easy for kids to grow and easy for people that have never gardened before. Um, and then on the transplant column, these are plants that you can sort from seed, but it's too late to sort them from seed now. Um, if you are gonna sort them from seed, they need to be baby quite a bit. Uh, you should sort them probably in February indoors. Uh, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, those are all nightshade uh, plants. They're all in the same plant family and they do need to be transplanted. Cabbages can be sown outside, but they take a long time to get to the size that you want from seed. So they're another one that needs to be babied and planted very early. Um, onions, you can usually find them this time of year as a set or as a bunch. So a set is like a bag of little tiny bulbs. Uh, and then a bunch is a bundle of stems. And you can find either one at the store at this time of year. Those are perfectly transplanted. Onions take forever to grow from seed, so I don't, I don't encourage you to try that. Um, and then I'm not gonna talk much about potatoes or sweet potatoes in this. They're not related, uh, not in the plant families, but they are grown the same way and they are grown from a cutting. And those are not super difficult to grow, but they need a lot of space. And um, I'm, I'm just not going to talk about them too much in this presentation, but if you have questions about them and you really like potatoes and you want to grow them, that's definitely something we can, you can email me about and we can talk about. Um, and then down at the bottom, I've got a few things highlighted in red that I just think that maybe you should try and avoid for right at the beginning. So things like celery and asparagus are a little bit more difficult to grow right out of the gate. Um, don't don't get any wild ideas that you're going to grow wheat and process it or anything like that. It's just not a good idea. Um, it's way too difficult and complicated. Uh, and, and there's a few other more difficult vegetables as well. But, you know, the sky's the limit and you can always try something if you're, you know, maybe asparagus is your favorite thing ever and you really want to grow it. It's not something that you can't do. It's just something that you need to research before just going out and trying it out. So now that we've thought about that, uh, let's think about a seed packet. So how to read a seed packet. This is just one that I had here at the house uh, for okra. So if you follow my mouse pointer, here's what it is. And then this is the variety, Louisiana green velvet. Here's a little bit of information about this particular variety. Uh, the most important section of information on a seed packet is right here in the middle. It's this little grid. So you've got, the days to germination, so 10 to 14, this is how long it's gonna take before you see a seedling come up out of the soil from when you planted it. The soil depth is very important. Um, seeds do not have a ton of energy within them. They have, they have energy, but it's just not enough for the plant to, um, they only have a, a limited amount of energy, I guess I should say, to make it more clear. So whenever you don't look at this and you plant those seeds too deeply, the seeds are not able to have enough energy to get up to the sunlight. So make sure that you always look at this and you make sure that you don't plant seeds too deeply because they won't come up. 
The plant spacing is important as well. So we have two numbers here, the row and the plant. So the row number, so okra is a really large crop, uh, especially once it, we get into the hot, hot days of summer. Uh, so rows of okra need at least 36 inches between them. And in each row, the plants need at least 18 inches of space between each plant. So that's going to clue you in when you're looking at this packet that this is going to be a big plant. Uh, it needs a lot of space. And then finally, our last number over here on the end, 58 days to harvest, that's how long it's going to take from whenever it comes up out of the soil to when you're going to get your first piece of okra. So some other information that's on the packet, it's good to know. Uh, we've got the expiration date here, which is always going to be stamped on a seed packet somewhere. Um, you can, you, you want to use as close to the current year, as in fresh seed as you possibly can. If you have seed from last year, it's not the end of the world. I do it all the time. Um, but you need to know that the germination rate on those seeds from last year is, is just not as good. It's going to decrease every single year. Um, let's see if there's anything else. And the growing tips. So this is, this is a good indicator of, you know, I'm not really sure what to do with it. Does this variety need support? Um, this one says, you know, it's, we can seed it directly outdoors. That's a great little indicator right there where it's going to tell you that you can just go out and pop that right in the ground and it's going to be good to go. Uh, you need to make sure, you know, look these over every time you have seed packets because each variety is going to be different. Okay, so if you aren't growing it from seed and it's something like a tomato or a pepper and you want to transplant it, um, some things to look for when you're at the store and you're picking out your plants, make sure that they look healthy. Don't pick out a plant that looks sickly and sad. Uh, we're going to look for something that looks bushy and robust. Uh, don't get the green thumb too early in the year. Wait until the chance of frost has passed. So in, in Georgia, we're going to wait until mid-April before we put out any of those tender plants like tomatoes and peppers. And then these are just some tips to think about when you are planting your, your new tender plants. Um, make sure to transplant them on a, on a cloudy, windless day. That just helps the plants adjust better to being out in the full sun. Uh, the wind can sometimes be a lot for them at first as well. Make sure you dig a big enough hole, uh, soft, Break up the root ball if it's any if it's slightly root bound and um, cover it with soil. Give it a big drink of water, and then should if you plant it in mid April and you see on the Weather Channel that the temperature is going to dip below freezing or close to freezing, you might want to cover it with some sort of tarp or an old sheet, something like that, just to protect it from that that cold snap of air. So container gardening. And I'm only going to briefly touch on container gardening. This presentation is really geared a little bit towards more towards bigger gardens. But many of us, of course, you know, we live here in the metro area. We might be, I live in an apartment, you know, I have a container, you know, gardens, and I also have raised beds. So container gardening is best for small spaces and it's best for small crops. Um, so it's a good situation if you have just one or two tomato plants and they can just hang out and you can baby them and take care of them as much as you like. Um, it's good for really small crops like radishes as well that are just very compact. And uh, some things that you should really avoid are those, oh, the, sorry about that, the big guys, corn, okra, squashes of any kind, um, cucumbers are hit or miss. Some of the varieties are quote uh, container geared and um, you're more than welcome to try those. I would encourage you to use some sort of trellis if that was the case. They are a vining plant and they will take up a lot of room still. Um, and of course you're always going to want to make sure that it's in full sun if possible or in the sunniest spot that you can put it in. The other consideration with container gardening is that because the dirt in the pot is outside, I mean, it's in a container, it's going to dry out more quickly. So you're going to need to water it frequently. You're going to need to, to touch it and make sure that the soil is 
Um, see if it's dry, and if it is dry to the touch, you're gonna wanna go ahead and give it some water. So I also have lumped uh, raised beds into this with container gardening, is if you really think about it, they are basically a large container. Um, the good thing about raised beds is that they're very aesthetically pleasing. They have a clearly defined space within your yard that is for vegetables or for flowers or whatever you, herbs you choose to grow. Um, and they look nice. And that's a great reason to have them. You know, they keep that area separated from when, they're, when you're mowing the lawn or things like that. You can get them as kits. Um, you can build them from scratch if you're handy. But the one thing that I really want to stress with raised beds is that the shape of the container is just as important as its size. So if you make a gigantic square raised bed, suddenly you might discover that you can't reach the plants in the very middle and it's hard to weed. So I would really encourage you to make long skinny raised beds if that's if you're building them or if you're installing some or you know looking online. Definitely think about how long you can reach into the middle of a, of a raised bed. So typically when you install raised beds, you're gonna fill them with soil, uh, like fresh potting soil. If you are doing that, you don't need to soil test typically, but after a couple of years of gardening in the same soil, you absolutely should do a soil test. Um, and I'll go into that in the next couple slides. So after several years, make sure to check it for the nutrient balances and make sure that it's up to snuff and that you don't need to add anything. So vegetable gardens. So if you have a lot of space and you really like to cook and you like to be outside in the summer, maybe having a big vegetable garden is for you. Um, I love vegetable gardens. This is actually a picture from my in-laws vegetable garden back in Kentucky and they grow a huge one every single year and it is so much fun. I absolutely love going there and just picking corn and beans and we have a great time with that. So a big large-scale vegetable garden is always going to be best for those big crops like corn, squashes, um, melons, cucumbers, anything like that. But of course, all the other stuff does just as well. Your tomatoes and peppers, your beans, um, your flowers, if you choose to grow them in your garden, a lot of people do. But it is gonna be a considerably much larger amount of work. So a big vegetable garden will produce a lot if you put in a lot. So you're gonna be putting in a lot of effort as well. So, we're thinking about our spot that we all have and then where we want to garden. And we've talked about space and sunlight and water, but now that we're thinking about a big in-ground garden, we need to think about some other things as well. We need at least six hours of daily sunshine to make it work. If you're not getting six hours of sunlight, um, everything is not lost. I do have a slide here in a little while about shade gardening. Um, but it's just not gonna be a good idea for things like tomatoes and peppers, any of those crops. They just, they need as much sunlight as they possibly can get. So you're also gonna wanna avoid trees and hedges just because they will shade your plants, but also because they're gonna have a large root area that's gonna be difficult to dig into. We wanna avoid rocky or weedy areas, uh, a site that holds water all the time. Um, and then finally think about how far it is from your house. So if you have it on a different piece of property or you know, a couple of miles from where you work or something like that, it's not the same as if it's right in your backyard where you can walk out and grab whatever you need or take it directly to your house. It makes it more difficult to maintain as well. And finally, think about barriers. So you might wanna consider setting up some kind of fencing just because of deer or dogs or neighborhood kids or all kinds of different things like rabbits and things of that nature. And probably you're gonna have some wildlife damage, just expect it. So we have our site, we've all thought about it, and now we are ready to make it ready to plant. And, and ideally this is something you would do in the earlier spring. So mid-May is pretty late to get started on a vegetable garden. Um, okay, there, there's my other picture. But 
this is all some good stuff to talk about and think about for the future if you decide to do it. And it's not impossible to do it now, but the ground is much harder at this time of year. So it's a lot, it takes a lot more effort to get the soil turned. Um, so first thing you would want to do is kill the grass and weeds. So if you're in a, you're putting your vegetable garden in a lawn, um, oh, sorry about that. You're going to want to get rid of the grass. So you're going to use either a non-selective herbicide, which just means that it kills everything that it touches, something like Roundup. Um, or you can do it with solarizing, which is using large plastic sheets, and you would put those down in your yard with either landscaping stakes or, uh, you know, wooden stakes of some kind to hold it in place for about a month. And the sunlight will basically cook the weeds and, and um, the ground underneath. So that can be one way to do it. And that way you can go in and the ground is, you know, you killed that grass layer and you're able to till it up. So after you have everything dead, you're gonna turn the soil either with a small tiller or manually with a hoe. And uh, this is really for a small, very small garden. I have, I have done this myself manually and it is a lot of work. Don't kill yourself. Find somebody on, you know, a friend or Craigslist or somebody that has a micro tiller and have them just come over and do it for, you know, it won't take them any time. Um, and then finally, now you're going to want a soil test. So you're going to take a soil sample by going out in your garden with a trowel and a bucket. And you're going to go around your garden and you're going to take up little scoops of dirt up to eight inches in depth. And you're going to blend those in a bucket and you're going to come to the county extension office, which is where I work, and we have bags there for you to um, fill your soil with, and there's instructions on them. We take care of it. For a small fee, we send them to the lab in Athens, and they will give you a full readout of what kind of nutrients and pH um, and fertilizer that you need for your soil. So, of course, right now our offices are closed with all of the coronavirus pandemic. So we're sending everyone directly to the lab in Athens. And this, this link right here um, takes you to a website that tells you everything you need to know about soil testing, all the instructions. And for $15, you can request a soil testing kit and the lab in Athens will mail you the kit and you put your soil inside and it's already got the postage and everything. It just goes directly to them. Uh, so unfortunately, that's what we're doing right now. Normally, it only costs $12, $12 for the basic or $14 for the expanded test if you come into the office. So once you have your results from your soil test, you're going to get a couple of different things back from that. Um, it's going to give you a lot of information that's good. And that information is going to tell you what you need to put into your garden to get it up to speed where you're not going to have any issues with nutrients with your plants. Um, so I'm not going to talk a ton about pH in this, but you want it to be at least 6 or 6.5. Uh, up to 7 is okay as well. Above 7 is not good. It's too basic. That's very rare. Uh, below 6, you're getting into acidic soil, and so you're going to need to lime. Now, if that's the case, that's a conversation that we can have offline because liming has a lot of steps and things to consider, and it's very tailored to your personal situation. So not everyone needs a lime, but probably everyone is gonna need to fertilize in some form or fashion. And if you're organic or wanting to be organic, that's completely fine. You just need to understand that all plants need nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three big nutrients uh, for gardening. And so I, I wanna just, have everyone turn their eyes over here to this bag of fertilizer. And this is just a screenshot that I took. I got on walmart.com and just picked a random um, bag of fertilizer for, for us to talk about today. And the reason that I picked this one is because it has the three numbers. So when you go to the store and you're looking for a fertilizer, you've got your soil test results and you see that you need uh, to add a little bit this is a good approach. So this has all three major nutrients. So this is a ratio of of what's inside your bag. So if this was a 100 pound bag, you'd have 12 pounds nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, and five pounds um, potassium. Sorry, I got tongue tied there. So that lets you know that this is a relatively balanced fertilizer. It's 
geared towards tomato and vegetable gardeners. Um, and it's made so that it has most of the nutrients you need. So there's two ways that you can apply the fertilizer. You can either broadcast, which means that you would just spread it evenly throughout the entire area that you have your garden, and then you would take a tiller or a hoe and incorporate it by just tilling it into the ground. You're gonna do this before you have any plants there. Or you can do a split application, which is you can put half of it out like I just described, and then the other half you can do in small doses around your plants. That's called side dressing. So if you have a row of corn, a little corn area, and you wanna put some fertilizer out after the plants are you know, a foot and a half tall, you can kind of go along and sprinkle it by the plants. And so finally, just I'm going to briefly touch on this, organic amendments and compost. So you want to be generous with these. These are very um, carbon heavy in their ratios. Think of them more of a soil conditioner than a fertilizer. So they, they make your soil richer, they make your soil more aerated and more able to till, but they're not necessarily high in available nutrients. The other thing you want to make sure is that it comes from a reliable source. So if you get it from, you know, my cousin Jim down the road, make sure that Jim knows what he's doing. Um, because if he accidentally, you know, it's, it's made out of per, like say horse manure or things like that, perhaps those horses are on a weedy pasture and they've ingested weeds. Well, guess what? The seed is going to be in that compost. And so whenever you compost your garden, you just spread weeds all over your whole area. So it's important to make sure that you get it from a weed-free source. And I would encourage you to do that in the spring as well. And once you've spread it over the garden, you're gonna turn it in with either the hoe or tiller. Okay. So just some more considerations. We've got our site selected, we've got it tilled up, we've got our fertilizer in there now, and we are ready to go. So we're going to make a plan. We're going to either do grids or rows. Either are completely fine. Um, and think about the plant heights and plant spacing of what you want to pick, what you want to grow. So if you want to grow corn, beans, and squash, make sure that you put the corn on the north side of the garden so it doesn't shade everything out because it'll, it will do that. You know, tall plants need to go in the back. Um, and run your rows north-south. That's going to help maximize sunlight. Uh, course sun run comes up in the east and sets in the west and that just really prevents them from shading each other out. Make sure all the plants get as much sun as as they possibly can. And finally my final thought on this is this is if this is your first year growing a vegetable garden don't go crazy. Just start small plant a few things that you really like and next year if it goes good you can always expand. You can always do more and bigger and better next year. I also want to just give you these realistic expectations because I love to vegetable garden. I anticipate these things. I think a lot of times people get, you know, misty eyed and they're thinking about their perfect tomatoes. There's going to be problems. You're going to have weeds. You are going to have insects. You are going to have diseases. You're going to have things that, you know, the plant looks great, but it never makes a tomato or, or whatever, you know, it's going to be an experiment a one big happy experiment. Um, so expect that things are gonna vary from year to year. You might have something that does awesome in 2020, and then in 2021, when you plant again, it doesn't do squat. And you're like, what happened? I mean, weather can be a huge impact. Um, soil conditions, diseases, insects, all kinds of different things. And then I've got some other thoughts in here too. So if you guys in your family Say you guys love onions or love peppers, plant a whole bunch of them. Plant habaneros and jalapenos and bell peppers. Plant several different types. And then, you know, you might see that the habanero does crazy and that the bell pepper doesn't do that good. So next, that kind of helps insulate you from not having much of anything. And it gives you a kind of a variety to see what you might like. Um, and then I'd also say, you know, try something different each year. Don't just grow the same stuff year after year. Maybe look at your seed catalog or go to Lowe's and browse around and see what you can find. Try something new. You know, it might surprise you. And of course, always try to have fun. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm going to do for the rest of this presentation, I'm just going to kind of 
briefly do like a super short and sweet overview of a couple different crops that I think are relatively easy to grow for beginners um, and give you some different tips on them and some varieties that do well. So herbs are nice because with a few plants you can supply your entire kitchen. Um, they're very prolific, they grow very quickly. So really the, the concern with herbs when you're wanting to grow them in, a, in, in the ground, you might wanna consider either keeping them in containers, such as a, a very large terracotta pot, or submerging your pots in the ground. So you can take like an inexpensive terracotta pot and dig a very large hole and then put your pot in there and then fill it with dirt. So you're basically putting it in a pot in the ground. And the only reason that I say to do something crazy like that is because these are perennials. So they are not, you know, they come back year after year and they can quickly overtake an area. They're very aggressive, especially cilantro and mint, which I have highlighted in red down there at the bottom. Rosemary, sage, and thyme are also perennial. Basil is an annual, actually, and I do encourage you to grow it because basil is, is great. It's very fragrant. Um, it's fun. It's easy to add to a lot of culinary dishes. So think about what kind of food you like to cook um, and then select a few herbs based on that. So root vegetables. I almost didn't include root vegetables, but I decided to go back and try it again because they're so easy and they grow very, very quickly. Uh, they like well-drained and loose soil. The big thing with them is that they need to be directly put in the soil. You should never ever transplant a root vegetable like a turnip or a radish, beets, any of those. They just really don't like it. Um, and like I mentioned before, carrots, for whatever reason, I just struggle with them. They take a, they're much, much slower to produce a carrot um, than a turnip or a beet or a radish. Radishes are so fast. You can probably in 45 days have a full crop of them. These are some over here that I pulled myself maybe two weeks ago. Um, then I've just got some varieties here. So cherry bells and Easter eggs, those are great radishes, little red ones and um, French breakfast as well. Turnips, purple top white globe is kind of like the ultimate standard. That's, that's your traditional turnip. But there's also these really great Asian salad turnips if you can find them. They're very mild, uh, typically like a white color. And they're, and they're quite nice. You can find them. And then finally, beets. The golden beets are a bright yellow color, very sweet. And these are some traditional reds. So tomatoes, we all love them. They're so delicious and flavorful. Um, in Georgia and the South, they are just very susceptible to diseases. So what I would really encourage you to do is to choose hybrids for your best results. Typically hybrids are going to have increased disease resistance and pest resistance. Um, and they're just gonna be a little bit more sturdy. Tomatoes do need supports to grow. Um, and again, don't let me limit your creativity or desire to grow whatever, you know, sky's the limit. And I have known plenty of people that don't cage their tomatoes. But I don't necessarily encourage it because when they're on the ground or touching you know, leaves or foliage or anything. They're just more susceptible to rotting. You do need to either put them in either a cage or you can use something like a trellis or even, you know, putting some wooden stakes out and running twine between plants and kind of weaving the growth in between. That can be one way to do it. Um, just get creative. They do need some, I think they need something. I'm oh, sorry. And okay, so determinate versus indeterminate. You've probably seen this before if you're at some place like Lowe's and you're looking at the different varieties. Determinate means that the tomatoes will put set fruit all at the same time. So this is used really a lot, mostly with sauce tomatoes. It's used in commercial ketchup production. And it's not a bad thing. Um, it just means that once the plant puts on its tomatoes and you harvest them, it's done. Indeterminate, they will continue to grow throughout the season and um, continue to set tomatoes. There's also types, you know, you have determinate versus indeterminate, you also have types. So you have cherry and pear, slicing tomatoes, sauce tomatoes. There's really just a plethora of different kinds of varieties. So 
another thing to, to do your research on, you might get really, again, misty eyed about those delicious tomatoes and get some crazy tomato that's an heirloom or something like that. And I'm totally all about that. Um, this is really where picking different varieties in your garden is going to come into play because you might find that one variety doesn't do anything for you and or doesn't produce a lot of tomatoes and another one just absolutely puts them out like crazy. So for a container garden, if you just have a, one big pot, I would really encourage you to do a cherry tomato because they will produce a ton of little bitty tomatoes. Sun Gold is my absolute favorite tomato ever. I think it just has great flavor. Um, if you're in a large garden, you have a little bit more room to do slicing and sauce tomatoes. So Rutgers, Roma, and Celebrity, those are all determinate varieties. Uh, Beefsteak, Early Girl, and Better Boy, those are hybrids and they're slicing tomatoes. So peppers, I love them. Um, I love how flavorful they are and there's just so much variety in heat and taste. Um, you have super sweet to crazy hot. Um, they're a little bit easier to grow, than, I think, than tomatoes, a little bit more forgiving. And I think they're also excellent for containers, especially the hot ones. So if you like habaneros, they're gonna produce a ton. One plant will produce plenty. In fact, this picture over here on the left, I took it a couple of years ago. I had a habanero plant that was, it was a variety called Caribbean red habanero. And I just went out there one day and all these were on the plant. Like this was one day I went out there and that's all I got off of it. And it was, every time I went out there, it would be, you know, 15 more. So they will, they will produce a lot. Unless you guys eat a ton of super hot peppers, probably one or two plants is gonna be enough for your whole family. And so that's, I've also put down here at the bottom that for containers, you know, hot peppers are gonna be good because they're just gonna produce way more. For a large garden, you can get into those uh, bell peppers and super sweets. So cow wonders or a bell pepper, or things like that. Corn, okay. Corn is like the most ubiquitous summer vegetable. Um, I actually don't love corn on the cob. I do love corn, I just don't like eating it on the cob. But it's easy to grow. It's, it grows really quickly and large. Uh, so make sure to put it on the north side of your garden because it will shade out other plants. There's a couple other things to think about with your corn. So make sure that you plant it in a block rather than a grid. So when I say that, I mean, you know, either plant four plants and then four plants like in kind of a grid shape. Don't make it in one gigantic long row because it doesn't pollinate very well. It's wind pollinated from the other plants. So it just needs to be surrounded by its friends more or less. Um, another thing to think about is you want to grow sweet corn. So there's a lot of different types of corn. This is something that most people really don't know. There's dent corn, flint corn, grain corn, and sweet corn is what we eat. You know, that's what we like to roast and, and things like that. And typically you're not going to have an issue finding sweet corn. That's basically all you're going to see in a garden center. But I have noticed in a lot of the fancy seed catalogs, they will have different types of corn. Um, another thing, let's, let's talk about harvesting when the ears feel full and the silks, that's the black hairs on, on the plant, they'll turn sort of a black kind of color. That's when you know it's, it's getting ready to be, to be edible. So here's another thing, and I've mentioned insects a little bit, I'm gonna talk about them some more here in a little, in a couple slides. Corn earworm. I'm sure all of you have had an ear of corn with this rotten tip on the top. That's from an insect. It's not a big deal. Um, all you're going to do is cut that with a knife and it's going to be good to go. But that's very common. It's almost impossible to get rid of them, even in large sweet corn operations. So don't freak out if you see a little caterpillar in your corn whenever you pick it. Squash. Almost everybody likes zucchini um, and yellow squash. Those are our summer types. There's also the winter types like butternuts and technically pumpkin is a squash, so it's a winter squash as well. They are susceptible to diseases here in Georgia. Um, and, and that's just something that you need to be aware of. It's okay if, if that happens. You should try to keep them from having wet foliage and that will help reduce that problem. 
So you're gonna wanna harvest them based on size. So using like a large kitchen knife, you would go out there and whenever your zucchini is at the right size, you're gonna wanna cut it off. The thing is, these guys grow so quickly and they are very prolific. So I would really try to limit you to maybe two zucchini plants or something like that for your home garden because they will absolutely produce zucchinis and, or, or yellow squash like crazy. So just a word to the wise, a word of caution, um, don't plant too many zucchini. Cucumbers are one of my all-time favorites. They are just so refreshing in the summer when it's crazy hot. Um, they are a vining plant. They will cover a large area. And that's why I said, if you do try to grow them in a container, use a trellis. They're again, susceptible to diseases, just like the pumpkins and I mean, I'm sorry, squashes. Grow them in a hill. So you would put, make it a little mound of dirt and then you're gonna put your seeds right in the middle. Um, and they're gonna grow down from the little hill. And you should check them every single day. They grow very, very quickly. Um, pull them off just as quickly as they get to the size that you want them to. Um, and some, some suggested types. So there are different slicing versus pickling. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the Asian ones are typically a slicing variety. And they have kind of more delicate flavors. If you're into cucumbers, I encourage you to try them. Uh, straight eight is an old heirloom variety that's kind of like, can't go wrong. Beans, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk faster <laughs> because I know that we're getting close to the end here. Um, so there's a couple different types, bush and pole. Uh, bush beans need no support, pole beans need support, and half runner beans are a cross between the two and they still need support as well. Um, and you can use either a cord or you can use, if you've ever seen people make like a TP out of poles, something like that would be good you need to sow them in a row. So you make a long row and then you're gonna just dump your little seeds in there as you go. And then as they come up, you're gonna be really ruthless. And this is where I always go wrong. You need to be so ruthless and you need to pull out plants and um, thin them to whatever it says on the packet. So if you think back to the seed packet, it will have say thin to five inches or thin to 10 inches per plant once they come up. And at first it seems, you know, you're killing all your plants that you just grew and you get emotional and no, just kill them. Um, because what will happen is you will be overrun with beans otherwise. They're another one that's prolific. Okra, super easy, um, a very Southern crop. Uh, it's actually related to cotton, believe it or not. And it creates huge plants. Um, they will grow right through the very hot of the summer and they will grow right up into the fall as well. And they will continue to produce pods just right up until a killing frost. They are very prolific. You need to harvest them with a knife. Uh, and so if you have a kitchen knife and you're out there, you're gonna cut them, I'm sorry, let me see if you can see, you can cut them like right down here. The main thing that I really wanna stress with okra, it's relatively easy to grow. Um, it grows super quickly. So if you like okra and you've ever cooked it before, it can get really woody and stemmy. So you need to make sure that they are smaller than four inches, the pods or else if it's any bigger than that, you're not gonna wanna eat it. Um, there's actually a couple different varieties, not just the traditional green, you can actually get it in a purple color. So explore your options with that, but okra is, is very easy. And then I've got a couple slides on flowers, just because flowers are really fun. Zinnias and sunflowers are both easy to grow. They have large seeds and you can directly sow them into the ground. Um, they make excellent cut flowers during the summer. So they're very cheerful. Um, they're something that I like as well and they can be good in a garden. Okay, so if you have been in this presentation and you're like, oh my gosh, I have way too much shade to grow any of these things. Again, hope is not lost. Um, think about your vegetables and stuff that you like to eat. And my rule of thumb is quote, anything solid green. So that's gonna be like your cabbages, kale, greens, broccoli and cauliflower, these little guys here, bok choy, over in the picture, any of those kinds of things are gonna tolerate shade. They're gonna do better in sun, more sun, but if you have a lot of shade, they will, they will take it. They might actually do produce sun there. Um, they will grow slower in a shadier environment than if they were in full sun. And um, 
the other big thing to consider is with cabbages, and there's a reason I didn't go over them much in this presentation, is because they are very susceptible to pest. And that's gonna be the cabbage worm, is the, the big nightmare one. This looks like a little green slug and it just decimates everything. So if you are growing greens or cabbages, anything like that, and you um, want to protect it from insects, one thing you can do is using a physical barrier, such as netting over your plants that can help reduce the instance of insect damage. Okay, just really quick on your maintenance, pest, weeds, and diseases. Trying to keep your foliage dry on your plants. If you are watering them, try to water towards the roots because wet foliage leads to disease. And another thing that could be a big thing is to rotate your garden. So if you have a large, large garden and you are growing kind of the same stuff year after year, move the crops around. So don't put the tomatoes in the same, you know, south corner or whatever year after year because that ground will become nutrient depleted. And it'll also have all of the pests and diseases that are for that you know, if you have tomatoes there every year, it's going to have tomato diseases and tomato pests. So if you put something else there, those, it kind of breaks the disease cycles. Weeds can quickly take over your garden. Do not let them get in control of you. Do not let them go to seed. Um, I've got a couple different things here. The main thing is just remove them. Either you do it by hand, you can use it by tilling the rows. A lot of people I know that have large gardens, they might have a tiller. They can just run the tiller up through the rows and just crush everything. Um, mulching can help suppress the growth of weeds, you know. Uh, herbicides, of course, are always an option, but you need to be careful with your other garden plants because you'll end up perhaps killing things that you didn't mean to. Diseases, really the big things are to keep your plant foliage dry. Um, and space your plants appropriately so they're not touching each other. That can help decrease the spread of disease. I've got a couple things down here under the keep things clean. That's just really, you know, remove dead things, remove sick plants, remove rotting fruit, um, turn the soil frequently. That can be a good thing. And always use fresh seed and plants. You know, don't pick plants at the store that look sad and, and diseased. And finally, insect damage, be realistic. You are gonna have insects. They're going to eat some of your plants. That's just part of it. Um, and, and accept that that's okay. You know, you're gonna lose some stuff, but you're gonna get some stuff too, and it's gonna be all right. So again, just like I was mentioning, rotate your crops and just move them around in the, in the plot. And, and maybe even grow different things in different years. So that can be one way of breaking the disease cycles as well. You can use physical barriers such as netting or cloth to prevent insects, especially on cabbages. They're just absolutely, <laughs> I've not had a lot of good luck with kale or even, you know, head cabbage, things like that, just because they absolutely will be destroyed by insects. Um, the other thing, let's see if there's anything else. Insecticides, you definitely can use them. Um, Again, just be aware that some insecticides can also kill beneficial insects and have other impacts such as, you know, killing pollinators and things like that. Oh, and always, if you're going to use any kind of chemical, always, 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 always read the label, follow the instructions. And then I just have a few tips, which I've, I've kind of um, touched on almost all of these already, so I'm just going to you know, briefly reiterate again, some plants are very prolific. Think of that about that and how much your family eats before you plant them. Check your garden frequently, you know, look for diseases, harvest frequently, um, choose plants that are appropriate for your garden's conditions. Like I said, if you're very shady, your tomatoes aren't going to do good. If you're, you know, full sun, go for it. Do something like that. Think about what you have in your space. Space them appropriately, remove disease plants, and finally just have fun. This is all just one big happy experiment. Like I said, not everything is going to do great. Some things are going to do awesome. You know, you might have a pepper plant that just goes wild and produces more peppers than you could ever possibly imagine. Um, so just prepare for some failures and some successes.
And then finally, just before we go into questions, I wanted to let you guys know that if you have a large garden and you like to can or you like to do any kind of food preservation, my coworker Alexis is doing a um, food preservation series this summer. And she's got four different ones lined up on some different topics. So if any of those appeal to you, you can email Alexis and I've got her email right down here. And she, you know, it's a free class just like this one. So if you have any questions about preserving your food or um, recipes, things like that, she is absolutely the best resource. So thank you all for listening to my presentation. I will now take some questions. I'm going to exit my screen here and pull down the chat. So if you guys have any questions, I'll take those now. So I see one that says, let's see. Any benefit to ordering from a seed catalog instead of buying seeds at Walmart? Um, no, not really. So what you're going to get in a box or you probably will have more varieties available to you than what you would see at a box or that's basically what you're going to get. That's the only, only advantage that I can really see. Plant seeds from veggies bought in stores such as peppers. So like, are you talking about at the grocery store? Like if you got um, a bell pepper and you pulled the seeds out? Yes. Okay. I've done that. I've had plenty of success with it. Um, peppers readily cross in the field. So if you grow bell peppers next to habaneros in, you know, one year and you save the seeds, you might have some sort of weird bell habanero thing the next year. So that's always a possibility when you save seeds. But um, typically if you're getting it from like a grocery store, they're grown in large commercial fields. So you're not going to have any issues with that. Um, yes, I am going to upload this video. I do have a video from last week as well, but I'm just going to probably make this one the main video. Um, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And I think that's, let's see, let's see if I have the, I can just send the link to everybody. Or if you want to just email me, I can send the link out as well. Okay, well, I have one more final thing for you guys to do. If you guys would take care of this, I would really appreciate it. Um, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna put this in the chat box for you. It's just a quick survey. It should only take less than a minute for you guys to, um, to take and answer all the questions. And it just helps us collect data on the people that are listening to our information and better ways that we can serve the community. So I would really appreciate that. Um, and that's it. If you guys don't have any other questions. Oh, I'm happy to hang out here for a couple of minutes if you have any.